If you want to follow along in the word, would you please turn to Acts chapter 21. Uh, Acts chapter 21, this morning we're looking at verses 27 through 40. Uh, Paul's arrest in the temple and a reminder to us that if we do serve the Lord earnestly, and uh, if that becomes apparent to others who hate the Lord, we will be persecuted for it. Acts chapter 21, verses 27 through 40. Would you please listen carefully to this? This is God's word. And when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the multitude and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And all the city was aroused, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. And at once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts on account of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he got to the stairs, it so happened that he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following behind, crying out, Away with him! And as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city, And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect. We're going to stop right there because otherwise we're going to go into the whole message that Paul preached to them on that occasion. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last week we saw Paul complete his journey to Jerusalem, and we noted basically, uh, well, a few things anyway, that he first of all didn't come alone. There were several fellow believers who accompanied him. Secondly, that his report to the Jewish church about what the Lord was doing among the Gentiles was uh, a great, well, actually brought a great deal of joy to them because the Lord was working still uh, to bring more into his kingdom, even the Gentiles. But we also saw that his reputation had been tarnished among the believing Jews, probably because of the slander of the unbelieving Jews. And we saw James counsel to Paul that might be able to remove that tarnish and Paul's willingness to follow his counsel, all for the sake of the gospel. And remember from this, the Spirit of the Lord was telling us that we should be willing to do all things for the sake of Christ in order to advance his gospel. We saw that like these men who accompanied Paul and like Paul himself, we should be willing to give our lives in the cause of Christ. We should be willing also to glorify God when we see him working through others. He doesn't necessarily have to be working through us. The Jerusalem church was very thankful for what God had done through the apostle Paul in his labors. And if we are willing to give our lives for the gospel of Christ, how much more should we be willing to sacrifice our reputation and our honor in order to honor other people whom the Lord is using? And then finally, I think we saw that we should be willing to become all things to all men that we might minister to others. As Paul was willing to submit to the traditions of the Jewish faith in order to be able to minister to the believing Jews. Now, obviously, Paul couldn't keep the ceremonial law or the moral law or lead others to keep that if 
He was doing so in order to teach them to, you know, that they had to do that to merit their salvation. That was the error of the Judaizers, and that was a denial of the gospel. But Paul could do this for the sake of tradition, for the sake of custom, in order not to give an offense, an unnecessary offense to the Jews, even as Paul had Timothy circumcised in order to make him more useful among the Jews. If we could just learn to leave those less important issues to one side in order to deal more directly with matters of substance, we might just find that the Lord could use us to accomplish more of his will to advance his kingdom. I mean, now, I'm not saying that everything that the Lord tells us in his word is not important. Everything is important, but not everything is necessary to go to the wall for. There are those things which are non-negotiables, those things which you know, are important that we must maintain in order to maintain Christianity, in order to keep the gospel intact, in order to have a message that will save other people. But there are certain things which are not as important that perhaps we ought to set aside. Now, Paul was not telling the Jews to set aside any of God's truth, but rather their traditions, though they were fulfilled, they might still keep those things because they weren't doing those things for salvation. That was their tradition. That was their custom. Paul was willing to submit to that. And again, he was willing to become all things to all men that he might win some. And if we could find within ourselves the ability to do the same and not require everybody to look down the line with us on every issue in life, maybe we'll find ourselves then more useful to the Lord as well. Now, this morning we're going to see Paul's attempt to minister to the believing Jews and how this is going to lead to his arrest. He was just finishing the seven days of purification in the temple when he was spotted by some of the Jews who had come from Asia. They immediately recognized him, and they laid hold of him, and they called for the other Jews to come and help them, not only to apprehend him, but to kill him. And while they were seeking to kill Paul, word came uh, to the Roman tribune, that there was a riot going on, and immediately they came down with their troops in order to squelch the uproar. And it's interesting that what we see here, that what began as an attempt on Paul's life, actually ends as another opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel to several thousand Jews. Again, we see how the Lord takes the worst of situations and is able to turn them around. And by the way, you know that he was not only able to do it back then, the Lord can also do that for us today. But this text reminds us of two things. First of all, that as we live as Christians, we have to expect that the world is going to persecute us. The world does not love Christians. The world hates Christians. And second, even though this is true, our Lord is in control of all things, and he cares for us, and he will overrule all things for the good of his church and for the advancement of his gospel. So first of all, we see that if we live as Christians, the world will persecute us. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time in this text to see that that is the case. Now, we do see that Paul set out to do what James and the elders in Jerusalem had counseled him to do, which was to go through this purification, to take this Nazarite vow, and to pay for these other four men to take them to the temple and to sponsor them, in order to show the believing Jews that they hadn't abandoned those customs, those traditions, that he wasn't teaching others to do the same thing. Now, while he was in the temple, he was spotted by some of the Jews from Asia. Remember that this was the feast of Passover. Jews from all over the Roman kingdom were there. Uh, that's why the Jews from Asia were there. And, of course, Paul had just come from Asia. That's where Ephesus was. And it, if anyone was going to recognize him, it would be these Jews who had just recently seen him. Now, when they saw him and recognized him, they immediately began to rally everyone they could, all the Jews in the temple against Paul, by pronouncing false charges against him. In other words, you know, we want to get people to come to our aid. We want to rally them against Paul. So let's give a dog a bad name and hang him. That's basically what's going on right here. So what is it that they did? Well, first of all, they charged him with preaching against the Jews. This man's been preaching against you. What, what was he talking about? Or what were they talking about? Maybe they were talking about Paul's assertion that in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Greek, but one new man, 
Remember that uh, they also, of course, thought Paul was preaching against their traditions and so forth. But here is one who is bringing Gentiles into the family of God and telling them that they have the same status that we do. Here is a man preaching against the Jews and against our customs. They charged him with preaching against the law. This is the very thing that James said the believing Jews thought was true about him. Maybe this is where all the confusion came from. But remember, Paul was not preaching against the law, at least when it's used lawfully to convict us of our sins and to turn us to Christ or to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. He was preaching against justification through the law and against the assertion that Gentiles had to become Jews in order to be saved. Now, obviously, Paul was adamantly against that. They charged him with preaching against the temple. Now, what did Paul say against the temple? Maybe he was preaching what the Lord Jesus Christ preached. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. That this temple was no longer necessary because the temple was now the spiritual body of Christ. Jesus was crucified, in three days he was raised again, and now the church is really his body. It always has been his body. It was never the building. The building was only there as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that picture had been fulfilled, and the temple was no longer necessary. We realize that Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. I think that the evidence points in another direction, but Paul certainly believed what the author to the Hebrews believed, and that is, now that the new covenant has come, that which is old is obsolete, and it's fading away, and it's ready to disappear. Perhaps Paul had brought that message out in his gospel as well, which is why the Jews were saying he preaches against this temple. And then they charged Paul also with the unthinkable, and that is bringing Greeks into the temple and defiling it. Now, they hadn't seen Paul do this. They had seen him in the city with Trophimus and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. But since, you know, we might think about the fact that since Paul didn't believe the temple was necessary anyway, and since Jews and Greeks are on equal standing, why not bring Gentiles into the temple? But we realize Paul would never have done this because of how offensive it would be to the Jews, even if he could. He wanted to make sure that he did not put a stumbling block in front of the Jews that was unnecessary, and that certainly would have been one of them. So here were these four charges. Paul was not guilty of any of them, but yet they purposely misunderstood or maligned what it was he had to say so that the rest of the Jews would join them in their uh, apprehending Paul and trying to kill him, trying to do away with him. Now, the result of this, of course, was that they were able to rally all the Jews against Paul. The whole city was in an uproar. They laid hands on him. They dragged him outside the temple and they shut the doors behind him. In other words, let's get this profane man out of the temple and then let's do what we can to purify the temple by putting Paul to death. Now, again, think about what is the source of all of this hatred? What is the source of all of this confusion? Why were the Jews trying to malign Paul? And what does this tell us about what the world will do to us? Well, it tells us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Again, we need to remember that the Bible says that the world hates Christians. The world hates the gospel. Jesus told us that we shouldn't be surprised. If the world hated him, it would also hate those who were his. If they call the head of the house Beelzebul, which means the devil, how much more will they call the members of his household demons and devils? Now, why is it that the world hates the gospel? Well, it hates the gospel, first of all, because it hates the idea of grace. You know how proud man is. Man wants to think that they can make themselves right with God on their own terms and in their own way, and everyone wants to believe that they are in favor with God. They hate to hear that they have fallen short of that mark. They hate to hear that they are alienated from God and that they need to repent and turn to Christ who has done everything that is necessary to save them because they like the gospel of good works. But I think that reason is nothing compared to the fact that the world hates holiness, as we've already seen. The world hates the light of God's truth. The world hates moral uprightness. The world wants its sin. Jesus Christ stands against sin. 
those who are his seek to live sinlessly perfect lives, even though they fail. But because Christianity calls them to live that same kind of life and because our lives, by the way we live them, uh, will also convict them, they will hate us for these things. That's why they hated Christ. That's why, why they hate us. And of course, if the world hates the gospel, if the world hates the Lord Jesus Christ, they are going to hate those who carry that message and who represent him. Now, we, we, we should put a qualifier on that. They will hate us if we actually herald that message. They will hate us if we actually shine that light. They will hate us if we actually live the life the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to live. Now, if we don't live godly lives, if it isn't clear that we're Christians, and if, especially if our Christianity or you know, our message has no reforming or convicting value at all on those around us, we won't suffer persecution if those things are not true. Now, we know that that's not a good idea. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ warned us against not shining our light or putting our light under a bushel. He told us that we are to live in such a way that all men will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, by this all men will know you're my disciples, by the love that you show for one another, and even the love that we show our enemies outside. We must live as Christians if we're going to be distinguished from the world and come under this censure. But if we're not under that censure, it's because we're not living that kind of life. Now, we do need to be reminded what our Lord Jesus Christ told us. And again, this isn't a scare tactic, but it's something which the Lord tells us is true. That if we deny him before men, he will deny us before his Father who is in heaven. So if we are hiding our light under a bushel, we want to make sure that we get it out from under that bushel as soon as we possibly can. And to make sure that we do confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's going to happen if we confess him? What's going to happen if we live godly lives? What's going to happen if our godliness reproves the sins of those around us? Well, the Lord says he will confess us, but we will suffer for it, especially from those who are most offended by the particular light that we are shining. Paul's message was offensive to the Jews among all the people of the earth. Now, remember, there were Gentiles who were unbelievers as well. And they were offended by his message. They thought it was foolishness, and they just disregarded him. They just walk away from him. Paul's message particularly offended the Jews, though, because it had implications for them, which were much, more, or much stronger than those for the Gentiles, even though the end result was the same. And that's why he was hated by the Jews. Now, if the message that we're preaching has particular implications for, let's say, one group of people rather than another, we're going to be hated more by that people, by that group of people than by other, other people. Let me give you some examples. In seeking to live for the glory of God and to promote the gospel of Christ, Chuck McElhaney was uh, put in a position where he was faced with persecution from the homosexual community. I think you remember the story that uh, they were in need of an organist and they didn't have anyone in the church who could play it, so they decided to hire outside the church, not knowing the person they hired, was actually homosexual. And realizing then that he was living this immoral life, they didn't want him to be in the service playing the organ, so they fired him, and immediately that brought persecution from the homosexual community. I, I don't know if you <clears throat> realize it, but before Chuck McElhaney moved down to L.A., uh, that the mayor of San Francisco had declared it legal for homosexuals to marry, and Chuck McElhaney immediately filed a lawsuit against them and won that lawsuit. I think you're probably also aware that, that that same thing has cropped up again and we're in danger of legalizing homosexual marriage in, in California, which we do need to be praying about. But who do you think among all the groups that were present in San Francisco, which group hated Chuck McElhaney the most? What's the homosexual community? Because the light that he was shining was particularly directed against them. That was one of the implications of the gospel. There are other people who may have been upset about it because maybe they wanted these kinds of rights for homosexuals, but it was mainly that community. Another example, uh, Peter Barnes, who was a Jehovah's Witness over 15 kingdom halls in the United Kingdom for something like 30 years, became a Bible-believing Christian. He converted to Christianity. And he began 
now in his, I think he must have been probably in his late 50s or early 60s when that happened, devoted the rest of his life to trying to get those who were in the Jehovah's Witnesses to the truth out of that, to repent of their sins and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, which group among all the groups in the world do you think hated him the most? But it was Jehovah's Witnesses because the light he was shining was directed against them. And just one more example, even though he, I don't believe he's a professing Christian, but I do believe he is Jewish, uh, Ben Stein, the one who, who did the movie recently, Expelled, uh, No Intelligence Allowed, which is exposing the, um, what's going on behind the scenes in, in secular academia, how people who even hint toward intelligent design are being blacklisted from the universities. As that is exposed for the world to see, at least those people who went to the, to the documentary to see it. By the way, it's a very entertaining documentary. If you haven't had a chance to see it, I think you'll find it to be very, very good. Who do you think hates Ben Stein? You know, who do you think is going to be bringing the lawsuits against him? But those people who were exposed by this movie, even though it's not particularly his fault, he was being interviewed by uh, R.C. Sproul, and he said that, you know, I'm not the one who wrote this. I'm just the narrator. I'm the one who, who acted it, you know. But he, he did, of course, agree with what he was doing. But it wasn't just Ben Stein. But because he's at the forefront, his face is there. He's the one asking the questions and getting the responses. He's the one who's going to be persecuted from this, not by everyone, but by those who's, you know, who are targeted by that particular exposure of light. That would be those atheists who believe in, you know, this... this fairy tale of an accidental you know, uh, situation that brought about all this marvelous design that we see. So again, the more light we shine, the more we're going to be persecuted for it. And the, those people that it's directed against, you know, that the, the light's shining against, those are the ones who are going to hate us. And the more we are hated, the more we are going to be persecuted. I mean, look at these Jews. They were intending to kill Paul. And they would have killed him if someone hadn't stepped in and overruled these actions of evil men for the good of his church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the second point, that though the world hates us, our Lord cares about us and he is in control and he will overrule all things for the good of his people. Now we see here that Paul was rescued by this Roman commander. The Jews were seeking to kill Paul, but while they were, a report was sent to the commander, a tribune, basically, a leader of some 600 to 1,000 men of the Roman cohort, which is basically, again, a tenth of a legion, or about 600 men, as to what was going on. He took some of his soldiers, some of his centurions. Immediately, they went to where Paul was, and they stopped beating him. Okay? The commander took him into custody in order to protect him from the mob, bound him with two chains to keep him from escaping and began interrogating the people to find out what this man's offense was. Now, the reaction of the crowd was so mixed with one saying one thing and one another that he wasn't able to tell what Paul's crime was, and so he ordered him to be taken to the barracks. And the mob, we read, was so violent that they literally had to put Paul up on their shoulders and carry him into the barracks so that the people wouldn't kill him. Now, when he was just about inside the building, Paul asked the commander if he could speak to him. And when the commander heard him speaking to him in Greek, then he had to change his mind about who Paul was because he thought Paul was that Egyptian who had previously stirred up a revolt of 4,000 men. They thought if, if there was such a turmoil going on in Jerusalem about anyone, it would have to be that guy. But he finds out that isn't true. Now, I thought I would do a little bit of uh, checking into who this Egyptian was, and I Basically, we learn from Josephus and Eusebius uh, what that was all about, and Matthew Henry speaks of both. He says, Josephus mentions this story, that an Egyptian raised a seditious party, promised to show them the fall of the walls of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and that they should enter the city upon the ruins. The captain here says that he led out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers, what a degeneracy was there in the Jewish nation when there was found, were found so many, or found there so many that had such a character and could be drawn into such an attempt upon the public peace. But Josephus says that Felix, the Roman president, went out against them, killed 400 and took 200 prisoners, and the rest 
were dispersed. This was from the antiquities of the Jews and the wars of the Jews. And Eusebius speaks of it in his history of the church. It happened in the 13th year of Claudius, a little before those days, about three years ago. The ringleader of this rebellion, it seems, had made his escape, and the chief captain concluded that one who lay under so great an odium as Paul seemed to lie under, and against whom there was so great an outcry, could not be a criminal of less figure than this Egyptian. See how good men are exposed to ill will by mistake. So again, all this uproar is going on. The tribune thinks, well, if they hate this guy this much, he must be that Egyptian. But he was mistaken because apparently the Egyptian didn't know Greek, and Paul did. Paul replies, I am not that Egyptian, I am a Jew of Tarsus, a citizen of an important city. Okay. Now what's interesting here is that having said this, that gives Paul an advantage. Paul is not this Egyptian, not this sedition uh, or this seditious character who tried to lead people astray, but he's actually a Roman citizen of no insignificant city. In other words, here is a man who has rights. And so he asks the tribune if he can exercise one of those rights and address the people who are trying to injure him. Now, the, the interesting thing is, of course, that the tribune gives him that opportunity. And I think what, what's... Um, important to note here is the sovereignty of God in this whole situation because the Lord is going to turn this this you know this well, this situation where you have this mob that's trying to kill Paul into a an opportunity for the gospel that the gospel would be heard Jesus said that he would be with his church and no one can do anything to any one of his people outside of his control and so he overrules the situation for his good, and Paul bears witness to the thousands who, have been, who were gathered together there to kill him. Now, as far as what Paul actually says in his defense, we're going to look at that next time. But one thing I want us to look at now is the fact that the Lord does actually turn the situation around. Because the Lord will do the same thing for us if it is his goodwill and pleasure. Jesus said that we would be hated by the world, but he also told us that he would be with us in our afflictions. He may even allow us to bring a greater witness in our afflictions than we could ever bring in life. I mean, Jesus doesn't say he's going to keep us from affliction. Jesus says that he will be with us in the affliction. Sometimes those afflictions are halted and we're saved from them. Sometimes we have to go partway through them. Sometimes we go all the way through them. Sometimes we even die in them. But the Lord uses these things for his glory. The Lord used in the history of his church those who had tremendous gifts to advance his cause. Sometimes he did it through their life. Sometimes he did it through their death. Sometimes he did it through just simply their persecution. But we do know that William Tyndale, for instance, John Huss, Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, just to name a few. If you want to read about others, look at Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs. These were men who had powerful gifts that the Lord used through their persecutions in order to bring a tremendous and a powerful witness to the gospel. Sometimes the Lord will even, I mean, we see basically a parallel between their situation and Paul's. Paul's not going to be killed here, but he is eventually going to die for the sake of the gospel. But I want you to realize, too, that the Lord sometimes uses those who have lesser gifts, who may never have been able to accomplish much of anything in their lives on a very large magnitude to draw attention to Jesus Christ, sometimes he will do that through, through persecution and allow them to bring a tremendous testimony. I have just one example that occurred to me of that. I mean, for instance, Corey Ten Boom, who was someone who was just seeking to live a godly life, but found herself in a situation where when, when the Nazis took over and began to persecute the Jews, and the Jews began looking for places to hide, and some came to her, and she began to hide them, suddenly found herself in a very precarious situation. Now, she may not have had tremendous gifts. She may not have you know, been in a situation where she could have done much in the whole of her life, but in this situation, because of what she was willing to endure in hiding these Jews, and I think you know something of her story, that they eventually did find out she was harboring Jews, and she was taken to the concentration camps, and she was persecuted. Many of her family members died there and she survived. But the Lord allowed her to influence the world because of her willingness 
to suffer persecution. The Lord, you know, again, uses persecution to glorify his name. And persecution is something that we, you know, those that are very high profile often bring on themselves. But even those who are low profile Christians can also have to suffer. And the Lord may use that to bring glory to his name. Again, we may not have great gifts. We may not be able to do great things in the name of the Lord. But perhaps someday the Lord will call us to suffer for him. And in doing so, bring glory to his name. Because the interesting thing about persecution is when people see that you're being persecuted, they wonder why that is. And it begins to draw attention. Just like the hatred of these uh, Asian Jews against Paul began to draw the attention of so many other Jews. And the Lord used that to gather a huge crowd so that Paul could address them. Perhaps the Lord someday will allow us to be persecuted and in doing so draw attention to us so that we too will be able to speak on Christ's behalf, which is one of the reasons why the Lord tells us we should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Well, the Lord tells us through this text that all who live godly will be persecuted, but the Lord will use that persecution for his glory. Where are we going to find the strength to be able to go through that persecution if the Lord should will? And where will we find the strength and wisdom that we will need in order to bring a witness to Christ? Well, it's only through God's grace. And it's only through the means of grace that he communicates that to us. So be much in the word. Be much in prayer. Be much in worship. And the Lord will strengthen you and allow you to be able to give that witness if he should in his plan Uh, will that you be persecuted. And of course, I don't think I need to mention that the Lord also gives us additional grace at the table. And as the table reminds us about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he laid down his life for us in order that we might live, it also reminds us that every time we come to the table, we should be renewing our covenant with him. Every time we come to the Lord's house to worship, Every time we we open up the Bible, we should be renewing our covenant with the Lord, reminding ourselves of what we vowed to the Lord, what we promised him when we picked up his cross and began to follow him, and to, again, purpose in our hearts to go that direction and not turn aside, no matter what should happen to us. So as we come to the table now, let's, let's be reminded that our Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, told us that we also have to die to ourselves if we are to be his people, if we are to follow him, if we are to be his disciples. Let's purpose to do that now as we prepare to come to the table. Let's bow for a few moments of prayer and ask the Lord to help us.